Regularly scheduled programming will not be seen so that we may bring you the following special. Hi. It's the premier sailing event in the world. It's the cup that's never been lost. It's the race that may end the longest winning tradition in international sports history. Live from Newport, this is the 25th defense, the final race for the America's Cup. This is Australia 2. Earlier this morning, the gutsy and gleaming white 12 meter from down under, on her way to her toughest battle yet. She beat back other challengers to the America's Cup all summer long. Today, her countrymen are praying she'll be able to do it just one more time. Dramatically, the Aussies turned a 3-1 deficit into a 3-3 tie in this best-of-seven series for the pride of the New York Yacht Club. The finals have never gone this far. Liberty, the feisty burgundy-hulled American defender, carries a crew which is wondering this morning why us? Why, after 24 successful defenses of the Cup and an early commanding lead of 3-1, do we find ourselves the 11 men up against it? The men who must fight to keep the America's Cup the America's Cup. Good afternoon. I'm Doug White. Joining me here in our TV10 studio in Newport, Newswatch 10's Frank Carpano, who's been covering uh, the Cups all uh, summer and uh, providing great coverage along with uh, some of the best pictures we've seen in a long time. And joining us too, Paul Marshall of Network 7 in Australia, a journalist and a yacht racing enthusiast who has been uh, working as well in Newport. He's been covering this year's America's Cup for the uh, network back home. This is Paul's second assignment in Newport. He covered the challenge back in 1980. Let's invite you to just say a quick good morning to the folks back in <laughs> Australia. First of all, Doug, good afternoon to you and uh, Frank. And uh, yes, it's good morning to everybody uh, back in Australia watching uh, right throughout the country there on the Seven Network. Uh, I know it's early, around about two o'clock in Sydney, a little bit earlier than that over in the, uh, the Western States. Um, but stick with us because it's going to be one heck of a boat race today. The last re report that uh, we received here from back home, <coughs> excuse me, was that there was something like 4,000 people gathered outside the Royal Perth Yacht Club in Western Australia watching our live pictures today. And uh, similar scenes over in Sydney at the Cruising Yacht Club and uh, there we parties go. all over Australia, so uh, stay with us. Thank you, Paul. What you're seeing now, live pictures out on Rhode Island Sound, approximately 10 miles off uh, Newport, with the two America's Cup finalists jockeying for the start. We're told that the starting gun has sounded, and uh, Frank, let's see if we can uh, get a closer shot. We're gonna be using the Airship Enterprise all afternoon. We'll be using Sky 10 as well, uh, with live shots from our helicopter. That, I believe, is from uh, the blimp at the time you see Australia at the top of your screen and Liberty at the bottom. Doug, we're about seven minutes and 15 seconds away from the actual start. Course signals were thrown up about uh, 10 minutes before noontime today. We have uh, about uh, north-northwest winds, uh, five to 10 knots at the start, and we're told that they will gust to 15 knots today. And as you can see, as has been uh, the case in most of the starts, Throughout the series, Liberty and Australia, two more or less just feeling themselves out here, feeling each other out in the early moments of the pre-start maneuvers. There's a shot of uh, Black Knight. That's the official committee boat. Black Knight, along with the America's Cup buoy, form the starting line. When the blimp gets into a position where we can see both the uh, Cup finalists and the buoy and Black Knight as well, <coughs> pardon me, you'll be able to draw an imaginary line uh, between uh, Black Knight and the buoy, and that will constitute the starting line for race seven. Australia, too, has been, uh, was fairly strong during the trials in the starts, but, however, has lost quite a few of them to Liberty here in the final series, Paul. Uh, what do you attribute that to? Sure, we've lost uh, most of them, I think. First of all, you'd have to attribute it to uh, Dennis Connor, one of the greatest starting helmsmen of all time. Um, Australia, too, is, I am convinced, a much more manoeuvrable boat. She's like, at times out there, she's been like just a giant surfboard, the way they can throw her around. But uh, John Bertrand uh, is up against Dennis Connor, and, and Connor is a tough guy to sail against, especially at the start. Uh, John Bertrand and the Australia guys were out on the water yesterday practicing starting tactics against uh, Harold Cudmore, a well-known British helmsman who took over the wheel of uh, challenge, Australia's trial horse. And they went out yesterday and uh, had a tough workout to try and improve their starting tactics. So. Uh, We'll know in uh, just over five minutes from now uh, 
how that paid off. Also taking advantage of yesterday's lay day was the American boat Liberty. Liberty was taken to uh, Cove Haven Marina in Barrington. We know uh, that uh, some ballast was removed from Liberty. Uh, do any of you fellows have any idea what else might have been done to the boat uh, and, and what that would, would entail? She has to be, I'm sure, she had to be remeasured as a result of whatever they did to the boat, correct? That's right, they lightened the boat up in the anticipation that she would sail a little bit better in moderate winds. That puff of smoke, incidentally, Frank, is the five-minute gun from uh, Black Knight, so uh, looks like we're going to have a start in just under five minutes. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Sure. Now, once li lightening the boat up a little bit, I would imagine that would also uh, change their sail plan a lot around a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, doing it at such a, a late time, it, they didn't have the time to go out and retest sails. So. You have to wonder what effect that's going to have on Liberty today. Frank, I was up there uh, as you were uh, yesterday when they pulled Liberty out of the water. And uh, Halsey Herreshoff, Liberty's navigator, was talking about what they could do to the sails. Um, the mainsail they couldn't touch, apparently, but they were talking about uh, putting a longer spinnaker pole on, maybe. Or uh, at one stage, they were even talking about moving the mast, but I'm, I'm sure they didn't get to that stage. That would be a fairly radical uh, maneuver. There was, uh, there was mention of it, if not an admission, I think, by Dennis Conner at the uh, news conference after race number six that uh, they, in fact, were using the wrong sail, uh, that they depended too heavily on what were then simply predictions of what the wind would be. Was the sail too heavy a sail for I think they have today? had a, a problem with, uh, surprisingly, a problem with uh, the weather predictions here. Uh, the weather <laughs> we forecast. All do you, <laughs> but you guys are good at this. I mean, heck, this is America. You know, we've always been beaten by the weather before and by good sailors and good boats. But uh, I think uh, there's so many races now, but I think the, uh, the sixth one that uh, Dennis had the heavy air mainsail up, I think Australia had a medium air uh, main up. We can see both boats now and the committee boats uh, there in the, uh, coming up on the middle of the screen. Does it appear to you that, that Liberty has a slight advantage now going to the starting line? Or would we need to see the buoy for you to make that determination? It's really hard from here to, uh, to pick which boat is uh, Liberty coming around now. Australia was to uh, windward of her, but Liberty will come around onto uh, starboard tag now, so she will have right of way over Australia. You can see the Australians coming up now, coming up uh, almost head to wind. I think we have to make the assumption that an awful lot of uh, an awful lot of people in our audience are amateur sailors or perhaps even uh, land lovers like myself. So let's uh, we'll we'll get the boats uh, started. We'll uh, we'll try for the uh, for the start. Hopefully uh, later on in the afternoon we're going to be trying to take uh, we're, we're, we'll take some of these sailing uh, terms and reduce them so that I can understand them on the assumption that if I can understand them almost anybody can understand them. How's that? <laughs> okay, we'll make that promise to ourselves. Let's uh, introduce one more guest that we have with us, and it's a real honor to have him as one of our commentators today. Let's say hello to Ian Murray, the skipper of the Australian Challenger Advance, and since its elimination, uh, has been the helmsman on the other Australian Boat Challenge 12. Ian uh, was undefeated world champion in the 18-foot class. He has been involved in 12-meter sailing for the last 18 months, and, well, he knows what it's like to be out there on the course. Ian, welcome. Good, day. Good morning. <laughs> let's, uh, let's take a look uh, at what we've got now from the uh, blimp, and we'll ask Ian to uh, join us and see if we can't get some kind of a handle on who's ahead at the starting line. Well, where we have the start, um, both boats are up on the starboard tack lay line, which is the Black Knight's end of the line, and Australia 2 is trying to hold Liberty out above the line. Both of them coming up to the line, they have approximately a minute 33, so they're reasonably well positioned. You can see there that Australia 2 can lay through the line, and in that position she has Liberty forced out above the line, so she can't start at this moment in time. What they're, choice does Liberty have, Ian? They're both stalled out there, they're losing speed. Um, both of them wouldn't have a lot of steerage, especially if they're down below two knots. Liberty's options are to tack away and then jive around and come back, but with only a minute to go at the start, she doesn't, she can't do that, there's not enough time. Looks like she's going there to try and sneak through the passage. Um, Australia 2 can only bluff. There's, the uh, course there's there. the America's Cup buoy on the top of the screen. We just missed that shot uh, from the blimp. <coughs> That's right. What we're seeing now is just a the They're both over the line there here. Um, Watch for the puff of smoke on the committee boat, and that's the official start. The options aren't good here for Liberty. She is over the line, and she's not as manoeuvrable as 
as Australia 2 and Australia 2 is going to end up on a weather hip which is exactly what she wanted to do. We talked a little bit about the flavor of the starts in this series a little bit earlier Ian and uh, you said that uh, the starts that Australia 2 has lost have not so much been a case of, uh, of Australia 2 uh, Liberty winning them as much it was Australia 2 losing them. Mm. Well that's very much so. I think John Bertrand had, you know, a bit nervous about we, being uh, in Do we America's have a flag Cup. up here, fellows? I think we've, we've come to 12-10 and we've not had an official start. Are we going to do a restart? There was no, I don't think we saw a gun from Black Knight. I, I believe it may be the postponement flag. If we could get our blimp to zoom in a little bit on Black Knight to see uh, what, I, I think that the course flags have been lowered and a yeah. postponement flag. Is that a postponement that flag? That is a postponement flag. Okay, so possibly because of a wind shift now, they are going to abandon this start and try again? That's the only uh, reason that they could justify abandoning the start. If the breeze is likely to go left throughout the afternoon, more around to the to the west, and it, uh, of course they set at 350, they're anticipating to go around to 280, 290. Now, with a with a, um, a postponement, does that mean necessarily that we'll have to uh, set a new course, or can we simply restart the race once they get back into position? They won't restart the race if the breeze has swung, and the breeze must have swung for them to warrant calling the start off. So they'll probably just sit back and watch it for a little while and you know monitor the breeze if it's phasing or it's going to try or if it's going to stay where it is. Paul, uh, maybe you could outline for us just to indicate the, this business of starting the race by ten past two. That's uh, that's the limit, and explain the uh, the options on the other end. Uh, it is conceivable that if the winds are very light, uh, both boats could uh, race all afternoon, and we could not have a race. Sure, we've already seen that in uh, one of the races uh, during this series. The problem is, uh, as Ian was saying, is that if the wind does shift before the start, then they uh, they have to change the course, and that takes time, so they have no option. But Ian, it's just curious that we're back to the same situation that we had in the first race, where we tried to get two starts off and they were called off. I know a lot of the people back home, uh, some of the reports that went back there, made a few people angry when it looked like that Australia might have had an advantage, the race was called off. But as you see it, it's fair and square. They, ha they have no option. It's very hard being here not to know what the wind direction has done. Um, if the breeze direction is still around, where they set it at, I'm sure they'll be screaming blue murder from mm -hmm. Australia because Australia had liberty over the line then, which would have been a tremendous start for Australia. And but it, it's very hard to know. We we don't know exactly when they postponed. It looked like it was within the last minute. We know that very early in the morning, the skippers and the crews start to psych themselves up for the race, and, and then when they get out into these pre-start maneuvers, they, they try to psych each other out. What happens, Ian, when you, when you get over the starting line and you've either jumped the gun or we have a postponement such as is the case now, uh, what, what goes through the minds of the guys on, on board the 12 meter? Is it one of those uh, letdowns and then you have to start all over again and get, get worked up again? Well, the times we were over, you know, it flashes before your eyes, and I, I guess it, there goes my sheep farm or something like that. It, and, and today, you know, with so much riding on it, four months' work or four months in Newport's work, and probably another two years to add to that, it, it's all hinging on the start. And you know, I'd hate to think what's flashing before their eyes. It, you know, it's such a hard situation to come back from being over the line and one and the other boat's not you know it's, a, it's a, at least a 30 second deficit we have a uh, we have a report now that the postponement probably will be of at least 10 minutes duration and that is because uh, you'll see uh, the committee boat there going out apparently to uh, to um, set a new course so uh, it looks like we're another 10 minutes uh, from the start i have a question about uh, this uh, business of of lay days um, i think we are familiar with the rotation. Each of the boats has one lay day up until the first four races, and then after the fourth race, regardless of how it stands, each of the boats has one or two additional lay days to call? One, as far as I was aware, Ian might know more about that, but I think they had two for the series. Well, it's a, it, uh, the number is a, is a moot question right now yes, because sir. we're in the final race, but my question was, do you think that uh, Australia did the right thing by calling the lay day for yesterday? My suspicion would have been, with those true, uh, two strong performances tying up the series, that for purposes of momentum it might have been better for them to race yesterday. Do you think the wind was the only consideration or rest? Well, Australia too called a later, they wanted to uh, check their boat over. They'd had 
a couple of days that were quite windy in the end and um, their boat has, as you know, has broken down twice in this regatta and they wanted to make absolutely sure it was going to be right for the final. So I think that was the first consideration. Also they were a little concerned that they had lost two starts in a row and they wanted to try and get a bit of practice in and analyse what they were doing wrong, um, which I, by the look of that start has worked out well for them. And I, th I think that's mainly it, uh, mm -hmm. those two points and just, you know, make sure their management was in order and their sales were in order and just basically check everything over. If you're uh, just joining us, we're providing continuous live coverage start to finish, uh, both here in southeastern New England and also back to uh, Australia 7 Network in Sydney. Uh, Paul Marshall is with us, Ian Murray is with us, and uh, uh, also Frank Carpano. Uh, we've mentioned that uh, this is race number seven. This is the one that, uh, you know, it's a winner take all. The series has never come this far, so it'll be Liberty or Australia 2. If, in fact, we have a complete race, we're in a postponement now. We expect. Uh, Perhaps another attempt at a start in about eight minutes or so. But Frank Carpano is going to take us up to date now, and uh, we'll do a recap on the uh, first six races. Doug, perhaps uh, never before has an America's Cup Series or any other sporting event, for that matter, proven so many of the experts so wrong. It has been a wildly shifting series, to be sure. First, Liberty had the momentum, then Australia too, and then really no one. Here's a look back at races one through six and the false starts in between. Race one provided all the excitement of a good horse race. Two of yacht racing's finest thoroughbreds paced neck and neck around most of the track. The weather conditions favored the American yacht. Liberty has been a steady performer in the 12 to 15 knot winds and choppy seas found that day on Rhode Island Sound. But it was Australia too, which led by narrow margins at the start, first and second marks. The Aussies had seemingly secured at least a moral victory. Heavy air is supposedly not her strong suit, a theory that in later races would be proved very wrong. But on this day, Australia too appeared like the sprinter, trying to compete with a distance runner over a long course. It didn't look like the Aussies could keep up. Liberty overtook Australia on the third leg, and by the time the yachts rounded the third mark, Liberty was seconds ahead. But Australia too is holding a pair of aces. Two upwind legs were still ahead. In the trials, Australia made up many losses on this part of the course. As the boats approached the turn that would put them 4.5 miles away from the finish line, Australia had narrowed the gap. As they turned the mark, Australia appeared to be in trouble. We later learned that she had steering problems and was unable to move her rudder for 10 minutes of the fifth leg, causing this confusion at the mark. Dennis Connor took advantage of their opponent's breakdown and coasted to a one minute, 10 second win. Race two produced another Liberty win and the first protest of the series. The Newswatch 10 Goodyear blimp footage of the incident was entered as evidence. Testimony was heard for both sides and then the jury deliberated. Four hours passed and the rumor mill was busily grinding away. Australia wins, Liberty wins, Dennis wins. The blimp footage showed that Liberty tacked on the same line as Australia and Australia tacks away from a very close distance. The Aussies say they turned to avoid a collision. This footage was also viewed by the jury. The boat level perspective gives you just as good an idea of how close the two boats were. 3 p.m., a request was made for another look at the Newswatch footage. One more round of deliberation, and then the announcement by jury chairman Livia Sherwood. The decision has just been reached, disallowing the protest good. by Australia to... Obviously, I think it's fair that we were exonerated. We thought we were clean, and uh, we don't think it was a cheap protest, but on the other hand, we thought we were clean, so we thought we deserved a win. We proved without a doubt that we did not attack too close. I thought that we would win this protest, um, and I am... Uh, somewhat disappointed and surprised at the result, but then we've never won a protest here. In a prepared statement, the committee said, quote, Australia could have kept clear of Liberty, either by maintaining her course or by tacking as she did to avoid Liberty's covering tack. Bond said he planned to pursue the matter further, but that proved to be an idle threat. The only thing more boring than a baseball rain delay is a stalled America's Cup race. Race three had to be abandoned on Saturday with Australia leading as the time limit expired. Sunday brought a postponement after the start because of a wind shift. Two hours later, the race got underway. Liberty won the start by eight seconds and seven knot wins. But unlike past cup finals, the start was not a true sign of things to come. Observers were left scratching their heads when Dennis Connor took Liberty off on several tacks to the right side of the course. Australia picked up ground because of Liberty's reduced boat speed. 
The more Liberty tacked, the slower she went. Australia 2 won the race to the first mark by 1 minute, 14 seconds. Both yachts peeled away to a fatter spinnaker at the second mark, Australia still leading by 52 seconds. Liberty's chance of beating Australia 2 on this day disappeared with the sun on Rhode Island Sound. The Australians' final margin of victory, 3 minutes and 14 seconds. The series was now 2-1 Liberty. In race four, Australia 2 skipper John Bertrand lost the start when he allowed Dennis Connor and Liberty to cut in front of his bow. For the first time in the series, Liberty led Australia around the first mark. The American boat paced the Aussies around the entire 24.3 mile track, winning the race by 43 seconds. Race five, Australia 2 on the brink of elimination. The Aussies lost the start again when they jumped the opening gun. But they made up a 37 second deficit on the first leg and took the turn at the first mark, holding a 23 second lead. The Aussies went on to win by one minute, 47 seconds, becoming the first challenger in 49 years to win two races against the US defender. Once again, Liberty controlled the start, clearing the line with a seven second lead. The first leg has been the make it or break it part of the course in this series. On today's first leg, the two yachts played a patient game of wind shift. That's where you pick your side of the course and wait for a puff of wind to power you past your opponent. You're relying on a combination of your own sailing sense and the computerized onboard instruments. You gamble that neither misleads you because if you're wrong, you'll find yourself in second place of a two boat race permanently. Today, Australia caught the brakes. She slipped ahead by two boat lengths after the first tack, then stretched it to four in no time. Their advantage at the first mark, two minutes, 29 seconds. That was the race. The next three hours were only a formality and an afternoon of frustration for Liberty. Nothing went right. The crew set at Spinnaker, only to have it twisted at the top. The result, lost speed, lost time, and a lost race. Connor even tried to force Australia into a foul. That failed too. The Australians went on to win by three minutes and 25 seconds. The Aussies are now within one victory of breaking the longest winning streak in sports history. Uh, Paul Marshall, it's probably just as well that the race has been uh, delayed for a bit because we've just learned that um, the uplink to the satellite is finally in place and we are now getting pictures back in Australia. It is 25 minutes past two Sunday morning. Uh, back home for you folks, and uh, we welcome the folks from uh, Seven Network in uh, in Sydney. And perhaps you'd like to say good morning to them because we were under the impression that they were getting pictures right from the start. That's we've right. Uh, we've uh, Australia has had uh, no pictures. Is that uh, oh, they have correct pictures to this? now? <clears throat> right. Well, uh, it's afternoon over here, uh, 22 minutes past 12, and we're uh, waiting for another start. As uh, Doug said, it's about 22 past two in the morning Sydney time a bit earlier than that over in the uh, the west uh, if you didn't get any of the uh, the first start it got in we had the boats go up to the line we had about the 10 minute gun then uh, the boats went through their pre-start maneuvers got into it to about eight eight and a half minutes I guess Australia was well in control at the start had liberty and all sorts of trouble and then the, uh, the start was postponed. We presume because of a wind shift, which would mean that the course has to be reset and that will take uh, some time, probably uh, another 10, 15 minutes, I guess. Also for the benefit of the folks who are just joining us uh, with our live coverage in Australia, um, we must mention to you that our coverage uh, will be provided the, in the following way. Uh, the pictures you're seeing now are provided to us uh, from the Goodyear Airship Enterprise. We also have a live camera in Sky 10, uh, the uh, Channel 10 helicopter. We will be going to live pictures from a charter boat called the North Star a little bit later on. We have our cameras here in our studio, obviously. We also have a camera up, up above on the roof, fellas, so that if, uh, you know, we want to say hello to somebody or uh, we want to get a picture of the crew and blimp on the way back, we can wave to them. But uh, all by way of explanation so that the folks back home and our folks in southeastern New England know that we've got you covered for race number seven, the do or die situation for Liberty and Australia too.
It's the premier sailing event in the world. It's the cup that's never been lost. It's the race that may end the longest winning tradition in international sports history. Live from Newport, this is the 25th defense, the final race for the America's Cup. This is Australia 2, earlier this morning, the gleaming white 12 meter from down under, on her way to her toughest battle yet. She beat back other challengers to the America's Cup, Paul Summer in Newport. Today her countrymen are praying that she'll be able to do it one more time. The Aussies, as you know, turned a 3-1 deficit into a 3-3 tie in this best of seven series for the pride of the New York Yacht Club. The finals have never gone this far. And Liberty, the feisty burgundy-hulled American defender, carries a crew which is wondering, why us? Why after 24 successful defenses of the cup and an early commanding lead of 3-1, do we find ourselves the 11 men up against it? The men who must fight to keep the America's Cup, the America's Cup. And we say good morning again to all of the, or good afternoon to all the folks in uh, southeastern New England and good morning to our friends in Australia. Let's reintroduce uh, the folks who are with us. Uh, you know, Frank Carpano, who's been providing us with America's Cup coverage all summer for Newswatch 10. To my left is Paul Marshall, who joins us from uh, Network 7 in Australia. We're feeding live pictures to Australia. Later on, we'll be joined by various other folks who have elected to take this feed, which is being provided uh, by Channel 10 and uh, through the courtesy of the Goodyear blimp and a lot of other technicians have been working very very hard to bring you race number seven from start to finish also to my far right we have ian murray the skipper of the australian challenger uh, advance and uh, since its elimination a bit earlier he's been the helmsman on the other australian boat the uh, challenge 12. we're waiting for the official start we had uh, one attempt at it at 12.10, which is the official starting time. Uh, as you saw, as you folks in uh, New England saw, we had a postponement, and we're now waiting for the course to be changed. Now we'd like to say hello to the people who are watching uh, race number seven on ESPN. We're told now that we're feeding uh, ESPN as well. So we say a good afternoon to all of those folks and fill them in on the fact that we've had uh, a postponement here and we've not yet started race seven. The pictures you're seeing are uh, from our helicopter right now. Uh, I'm sorry, that's the blunt. Yeah, that's from the airship Enterprise. So the two skippers are jockeying into position. Uh, we're waiting for the course change, and um, I guess, fellas, we might be as little as three or four minutes away. Does that sound reasonable, or is it as far away as a couple that? of hours? <laughs> <That's right. It> <laughs> depends. <laughs> it depends how many marks they would have to move. I uh, guess how uh, as to how long that would take. Uh, and the spectator fleet has to be moved as well by the coast guard. Sure, if the coast guard is. Uh, is aware of the course change. I know during one of the races uh, the course was changed and the Coast Guard apparently weren't aware of it and the spectator boats came much, much too close to the two racing yachts, but uh, the situation did improve after that. You fellows, I suspect, have all been out on the race course at one time or another and uh, mentioning the spectator fleet, uh, that's something that impresses me. I remember in 1977 we had as many as 42 to 4,400 spectator craft out there in the fleet. In 1980, it dwindled to what seemed like about an average of 24 to 2,600 boats. Now, so far in this series, at least, um, I can comment on the, on the first six races. Frank, we've had, um, what, 12 to 1,400 craft out there at any, any one time? And this is just speculation. I don't think it's got much to do with the price of fuel. I think the word has gotten around over successive cup races that it's not really a great vantage point from which to enjoy the race. The mm -hmm. Coast Guard keeps you back about uh, a mile, sometimes a little bit more than a mile. Is that true, Frank? And we heard estimates <coughs> on race number six, Paul, that there were as few as 100 boats out there, spectator craft. I was amazed during in race six, as you say, there was just nobody out there and the weather wasn't that bad. Obviously, you get more spectator boats come out on a nice, bright, sunny day where the sea is nice and calm. But uh, race six was all right, um, and as you say, there were hardly any boats out there at all. I was quite surprised by that, because it was getting, uh, that was a vital race. Mm -hmm. We could have lost the cup there, or as we did, we evened the score and were still in there with a chance. Hope springs eternal. We're going to take a short break, gentlemen. TV 10's live coverage of race number seven will continue after these messages. We're back 
back now with TV 10's live coverage of race number seven of the America's Cup Finals. You're seeing our live picture from the Goodyear Blimp, the airship Enterprise. We're waiting for the start still, uh, as Frank and Paul mentioned, it uh, could be quite some time. So we're uh, just waiting for word from one of our people out there on the race course as to what exactly is happening. What we have here really is, a, would you agree, a, a kind of a curious mixture of news and sports. Uh, news certainly because by the end of the day, uh, except in the event that we don't have a finish, uh, much will be said and written for many years to come about the, uh, the cup that went to seven. Uh, and sports, obviously, because of the uh, physical strength involved, boat design, the uh, determination of the two skippers involved. Have you had much of a chance to talk uh, firsthand with uh, crew members or, or John Bertrand, uh, skipper of Australia too? Certainly, we, uh, we get to talk to John uh, most evenings after the races or more so on the lay days when uh, they go out to test sails or whatever and we wait for them on the dock to come back and uh, I don't know whether you know John or, or not but he's a very nice guy, uh, very easy to get along with and always quite happy to talk to everybody about, uh, about the races and uh, very honest too, I mean he's not overconfident. I remember during the, um, the first race against Victory, um, really a lot of people said that wouldn't be a contest, that we'd uh, win that 4-0. And John Bertrand was the only one who came off the boat and said, look, I think it will be a tough, a tough series and victory could very well give us some problems. And of course, after having said that, uh, victory went out and won the first race. <laughs> the difference, though, in the two skippers, you've got uh, Liberty's Dennis Connor, who is a very flamboyant type of fellow, and then you've got John Bertrand, who, mm. by my estimation, is just very laid back and a real nice guy. Sure, very relaxed. And I had a funny uh, comment the other day that uh, the Australian crew members get out and uh, run every morning around about six o'clock. We got up and uh, took some pictures of them one day and they're all very fit. And somebody made the, the remark the other day that Dennis Connor probably hasn't run more than 10 yards in the last 10 years, but he's still <laughs> one of the greatest sailors that has ever been produced anywhere in the world. So. You know, one of the most curious things uh, that we uh, that we have seen this summer is of course the uh, some of the food that you brought along with you We'd like to discuss that in a few minutes. Yeah, we can get to that in just a couple of minutes. <laughs> Let's go Okay, we welcome once again the folks who are watching uh, our live coverage of race number seven uh, if and when it gets started on uh, Newswatch 10, uh, ESPN has now joined us, and we welcome all of those viewers as well. You're seeing pictures uh, live from our Goodyear blimp, Rhode Island Sound, 10 miles off the coast of Newport. We had uh, one aborted start at 12:10, and I'm told now that uh, we will have a delay of approximately 40 minutes. So uh, it's going to be quite some time before. Not so much they uh, reset the course, but uh, the problem, as Frank and Paul both mentioned, is uh, the Coast Guard having to shift the spectator fleet now. The uh, race course retains its shape. We're simply moving it, correct? Well, as the wind direction moved and the course direction moved around a little bit, they'll have to appropriately then move the uh, spectator fleet. But the Coast Guard is by no means undermanned out there. Uh, they, they have brought eight cutters with them from Boston to New London. These boats come from 1841 foot patrol boats, about 10 Coast Guard auxiliary boats, and even a Navy destroyer. <laughs> and the, uh, the big sailboat that you, you might see in some of our pictures is uh, the American sail training ship Eagle that was here last year in Newport with uh, the coming of the tall ships which is itself a Coast Guard cutter. That's right. Yeah. Doug, I wonder whether we could just run through that start once more. Uh, I'm not sure whether all the people back in Australia uh, were with us when uh, the two boats uh, attempted the start, but uh, the 10-minute gun went off, the two boats went into the starting sequence, Australia came out on top, she was in control of Liberty, and then uh, I guess it was about a minute before the gun, uh, the race was postponed. Now, Australia was well in control, Liberty would have been in all sorts of trouble, and the race was postponed, as indeed it was uh, on the first, on day one of this series, when we had two uh, false starts. I was just wondering, uh, Ian Murray, uh, does it strike you as a bit curious that the wind always shifts a minute before the gun? <laughs> well, I, John Bertrand <laughs> might have something to say about that, but it appears the breeze has shifted around towards the west, and uh, that, that is what was predicted. But it seems funny that they leave it until 
the last minute before the start to to actually fire the postponement gun and pull them apart from their battle on the well, course. If you could, if you could be uh, cynical, Ian, in the first race, the uh, the opening race of the series, the same thing happened. Australia was in control at the start, and the gun went off. Now everybody jumped up and down about that and said, "This is this is dirty pool. This is not fair." But is it? Is it fair? Are you well, talking dirty pool shot by the New York Yacht Club? Let's let, let's straighten it out. About whom are we speaking? <clears throat> sure, that was they were the charges that uh, I know many people back home uh, in Australia were aware of. That uh, you must remember that we've been coming to this cup for a long time, and we've always been getting beaten either four nil or four one, and uh, it, it's a it's big news back in Australia. Uh, you know. What we say earlier on, we've got 4,000 people watching tonight this live coverage at the Royal Perth Yacht Club in Western Australia. So it is a big, big news story. And everybody back home in Australia just is desperate to see the Australian boat win. And I, it stems, I think, partly because of the battle over Australia's keel, that uh, the Australians built a boat, which Australia's designer Ben Lexon said was uh, an innovation. It was, uh, the keel was something that nobody had thought of. It was legal under the rules as far as anybody knew, and uh, it was an innovation. But the New York Yacht Club chose to, to fight it, and very, very bitterly. And while I think we, we all have a very good relationship between, between the two countries, I know it did leave perhaps a sour taste back in Australia for some time. I'd, I'd only bring that up because Yesterday, when Liberty was out of the water being remeasured, we were talking to Halsey Herreshoff, Liberty's navigator, the man who maybe first brought it all up when he wrote a letter to the New York Yacht Club saying that if Australia was allowed to race, if she was not disqualified effectively for having this keel, that she may very well go on to win the America's Cup. And he repeated that again for us yesterday. He said, look, this is not fair. Your boat is not a legal 12 meter. It should not be allowed to race. And so I think the Americans brought it up again at the last minute. So Have you seen the keel? We're allowed to jump up and down a bit. Have you no, seen the keel? No, I haven't. Have, have any of the <coughs> fellows that you're traveling with, any of your fellow journalists or any of the reporters from back home seen? There's one of them sitting it? over there. Ian Murray has seen it, I know, but uh, <coughs> none describe, of the television crews. Can have. you describe it for us, Ian? Well, we have reason to believe that the Australians are going to decide, uh, probably shortly after this race, when and if they're going to allow the public to have a look at the controversial keel. You've seen it. Here's your chance to tell the world what uh, it's like. <laughs> well, it's different to uh, Liberty's keel, I, I must admit that. <laughs> um, it is a, it's a winglet keel. Uh, winglets are angled down slightly. Um, and it's shorter at the cord length at the top than it is at the bottom. Um, there's quite a lot of sketches getting around that resemble something like it. it uh, rumour has it that has bulbs and things like that all over it. It, it doesn't have any of them. It, it's basically just a, a keel that has a reverse slope on the front edge and, um, uh, and winglets on the bottom, which are an end plate effect and to also increase the draft when the boat is sailing in a heeled manner. Um, it's painted blue and white. Um, and uh, I believe Mr. Bond's looking for a sponsor to, to, <laughs> I bet he is. to put on the side of it before he'll reveal it. <laughs> okay. Thank you, William. TV 10's live coverage of race number seven will continue right after these messages. race number seven in the America's uh, Cup Finals here in Newport, Rhode Island, and uh, we're told that it might be as uh, long as 35 minutes from now. Um, the 1974 America's Cup Challenge saw another design breakthrough in 12-meter uh, sailing, for sure. For the first time, the yachts were made of uh, aluminum rather than wood, and it was the first time a young man named Alan Bond 
burst onto the America's Cup scene. And as you watch this recap of the series between Courageous and Southern Cross, see how many people you can recognize in this film clip and how history does indeed repeat itself. Four, three, two, one. A yellow shape and gun signal the beginning of the 10 minute pre-start duel. Courageous on the right with Dennis Connor steering. He takes the offensive. The downwind boat has right of way. Dennis can try to force Southern Cross over the line early. Hardy's defense is to luff his sails and stop the boat. The Aussie reserves watch from their tender. 45 seconds to the start. The boats split and head for opposite ends of the line. The start. Courageous above, Southern Cross below. For one minute, the boats sail in opposite directions. Hardy goes right, and the percentages favor him since the wind shift at Newport is generally to the right. Hood tax to stay with Hardy. Much later, Hardy, having sailed far out on the right, tacks for the windward mark. The boats converge in the fog, a first test of speed. We should be on the ley line now, right? Very close to the ley line. Touch, just keep it rolling, huh? Hood can't pass in front of Southern Cross and tax away. You beauty! <laughs> the Aussies at right are upwind and apparently ahead. But now a slight wind shift allows Hood to head up toward the windward mark and work up in front of Southern Cross. Courageous rounds ahead. Now, a fact revealed only in our pictures. Southern Cross is about to hit the windward mark. With the heavy fog, neither jury nor spectators see it. If the crew of Southern Cross saw it, they should have re-rounded the mark. They don't. Courageous is 34 seconds ahead and pulls out for the rest of the race to win by 4 minutes, 54 seconds. Had a great day, thank you. Tomorrow will be better. Ted Allen Bond is complaining about Dennis shouting on the starting line. You think he's too loud? I don't know, I think he's just going to learn not to listen to it. It was quite, it was pretty loud. Let's have a little chat with him. <laughs> the best part of the game, I guess. For the second race, owner Alan Bond, who has practiced as a grinder, takes over that job on Southern Cross. Nice race today. Because of light air and wind shifts, Good the set. first race was inconclusive. The second race and a better wind should offer a better test. Thank you. Again, Dennis Connor at left pursues Southern Cross in the pre-start duel. And now, a near collision that leads to protests. The American Courageous in the foreground is on starboard tack and has the right of way. Southern Cross must tack away and complete her tack before Courageous is forced to change course. Both boats raise protest flags. The international jury will have to decide that one. Moments later, at the start, Southern Cross leads by one second. Courageous is forced to tack to get clear air. And Southern Cross tacks to cover. 
Courageous, in the foreground, seems to be ahead, but is downwind. Hood, closing the gap with Courageous. Southern Cross, in the foreground, is in the back wind from Courageous Sales and is forced to tack away. And now, the beginning of a classic tacking duel. Courageous passes ahead. Moments later, Courageous passes ahead, but Southern Cross is closer. I think he's gained a little bit. At their next meeting, Southern Cross has a favorable wind shift. Converging with Courageous. It's going to be close. We're going good. It's a cut slower. We're ahead of him. Southern sure. Cross, on the right, is ahead. If Southern Cross can win this tacking duel, the cup is in danger. But now, Southern Cross fails to cover, and Courageous goes to the right for the usual wind shift. She gets it. At the mark, Courageous is ahead by more than 30 seconds. And now, a test of downwind speed. Before the races began, Bob Miller, the designer of Southern Cross, said that if Southern Cross could just stay close to Courageous upwind, she would beat the Americans off the wind. Now, a clear test of that assertion. At the second mark, Courageous rounds first. Southern Cross rounds 28 seconds behind. One reason for Courageous superiority seems to show now. Southern Cross seems harder to steer. In quartering seas, she yaws from side to side, partially collapsing her spinnaker each time. In the same seas, Courageous steers straight for the mark. At the end of the race, Hood has Courageous one minute, 11 seconds ahead. While the two protests await decision, the focus at the press conference is on Alan Bond. We don't propose to discuss the protests. You'll have to wait for the outcome of that. Uh, when you analyze the uh, wind shift that we didn't pick, maybe we should have been allowed to sail on the America's Cup course in our training program. We might have been a little bit more used to the wind there. But uh, full marks too courageous. They say, sailed well and uh, uh, we'll just have to do better tomorrow. Uh, also addressed to you, Alan, is that uh, after Southern Cross, Cross Courageous, why didn't you tack back to cover? Well, that's the reason we lost the race. <laughs> <laughs> Pepe Croce and the international jury arrived to decide the protests of the two crews. Thanks, Jim. You gonna win? Well, we'll see you in about an hour. In the protest meeting, the Australians maintain that Courageous headed off, that is, turned to the left, to prevent Southern Cross from tacking clear. The pictures don't seem to show a change of course. Another view. By the rules, Courageous at right on starboard tack has the right of way. Southern Cross at left must tack and stay clear until she has completed her tack. The question for the jury, does Southern Cross complete her tack before Courageous is forced to change course? The committee decides that Southern Cross did complete her tack and rejects both protests. The race results stand, with Courageous the victor. Well, I mean, we were on starboard and they were on port. And they weren't going to cross us, so they came up here and made a nice slow tack, and, and I had all the course to miss them. You know, I'm not sure it would have been a serious collision, but, uh, you know, in 12 meters, you never know. They're pretty big boats. The Aussies lost by almost five minutes in the first race and closed to lose by only one minute in the second. Now, they are ready for a showdown in the third. 20 seconds before the start. Courageous heads down the line. The American Brain Trust watches. I think they've got some line to run. 
the start. The latest is over early and must restart. Southern Cross is over two and must return. Now it is a race to see which can restart first. Courageous has returned and now starts. Southern Cross is still heading back. Now she is on the right side of the line and heads up to start. Southern Cross starts 16 seconds late. When 12-meter boats race, the difference in boat speed is often very small. One boat may have a slightly smoother bottom, better sails or better trim sails, a better helmsman, or even one who is at the moment concentrating better, or a better hull shape. Whatever it is, the American Courageous is gaining foot by foot, a tiny difference. But in a match race, that is all the difference that's needed. The fourth race confirms what everyone now knows. Courageous and her crew go faster. She takes the start and continues to pull out, winning by 7 minutes, 19 seconds. with our pictures on Rhode Island Sound from the Goodyear Airship Enterprise. What you're seeing is a committee boat. Um, I'm sorry, that's a... Uh, Fire 3. Fire 3. Yeah, Fire 3, the tender of uh, the American boat Liberty. And we'll have a shot of uh, Australia 2 in just a couple of moments, perhaps. But uh, they're busy changing uh, the race course now uh, because of uh, a wind shift. Uh, we expect a delay of uh, perhaps another half hour, I guess. Um, just a postscript to that uh, piece you just saw. Alan Bond, of course, uh, challenged again in 1977 and 1980 with very little success, and it took until 1983, in fact, to uh, mount the strongest of his uh, series of challenges, and what a challenge it has been. We are now in race uh, number seven, or anticipating the start of race number seven in the 1983 America's Cup Finals, Australia and Liberty at three wins apiece. TV10's live coverage of race number seven will continue right after these messages.